open in our Bible to Romans chapter 9. Um, if you don't have a Bible, we should have one at our welcome table. If not, the scripture will be on the screen. In just a moment, we're going to read Romans 9, 19 to 29. We're going to cover a portion of last week just to get a, the big picture and make the connections. But as you're taking a seat and um, as we begin this time, I want to start off by asking if someone can tell me what this acrostic stands for. Um, in the next slide. Anyone want to give it a shot? That's 10 letters. Stands for a statement. I know, we live in a world of acronyms. Hey, texters, guys, I get acronyms all the time, so this is a test for you. Don't Google it. You're not allowed to Google. You want to try? Oh, you can see it. He knows the answer. All right, I, I, you, you, you've waited long enough. This acrostic stands for this. Please be patient. God is not finished with me yet. Please be patient. God is not finished with me yet. Ten letters. So next time, if you're too tired and lazy to type it all out, there's ten letters you can do, right? Add it to your dictionary. It's a request for others to be patient with us as we are growing in God's grace. But it's also a request for patience based upon the fact that God's patience has been displayed towards us. That's the premise of that. Have you ever tried working with someone to only run out of patience and give up and say, I'm done. I'm not working with this person. Parents, have you felt like that with kids? I'm done, at least for the hour. Here, hold this child. I need a break. Yes. If a parent says no, you're lying. Have you experienced that at work? Yes. Maybe with your siblings. Maybe with your parents. Maybe... In fact, every relationship possible. But how about you and me? Has anyone ever tried working with you and given up due to your lack of commitment or being what some call being flaky? You see, patience, people say, is a virtue, and that is very true. Maybe a better and more clear statement is this. Patient is a divine virtue that it first comes from God that we receive in order that we may be able to give it to other people. Because living in a fallen world that rejects the idea of God, we would be more helpful and precise to understand it is in indeed a divine virtue. Means that in the midst of our struggle with patience and acknowledgement that it is a virtue, a good thing, we must look to the God who displays his endearing patience to a fallen people in need of him and his patience so that more and more people can receive his grace. That's what I want to talk to you about today. And we want to talk, turn to Romans chapter 9 and read together from verse 19 until verse 29. And then let's consider that together. All right? Hear now the word of the Lord. Will you say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand for glory? Even us whom he has called, not from Jews only, but also the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And it is the very place where it was said to them, You are not my people, 
they will be called sons of the living God. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we pray now and we ask that through the Holy Spirit, you would grant us illumination, that both understanding and conviction would come from you, and that you would give us the grace and the strength to respond to you in humble obedience. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So, so far in this chapter, again, especially if you're here with us for the first time or you haven't, you maybe you've missed a week or two, it's hard to um, parachute into the middle of uh, a letter and figure out what's going on here. But just to give you an idea, uh, the previous chapter, Romans chapter 8, is considered to be the greatest chapter in the Bible where the Apostle Paul takes the letter this is written to is a group of Christians in Rome, a church in Rome, and he's telling them about all the greatness of God's sovereignty. And it's like him taking a group up on a mountain on a beautiful day that sits and gives you a beautiful view of creation. He's taking them up, and the apex of that mountain is Romans 8.28 that God works all things for them that love him are called according to his purpose. And so there they're enjoying the mountaintop. But while at the mountaintop, the people also can look down and they see how vast majority of Israel, the people through whom the promise of God came as a, for a savior, that vast majority of them have rejected this promised savior, the Christ, and they are living in spiritual darkness. So Paul turns from the magnificent beauty of Romans 8 to address the gloom and the importance of questions in Romans chapter 9, where God's glory still shines as bright as ever. The driving question is this in this chapter. Has God's promise to save Israel failed? Has God failed to keep his word? His short answer is absolutely not. But then for the sake of Christ's followers, those from a Christian background, from a Gentile background and a Jewish background, he says, let me explain to you. He says, the sovereignty of God in salvation and in judgment is this. In fact, for the last four weeks, we have considered Paul telling us a number of things in the first five verses, how God saves sinners on the basis of his grace and not our heritage. We've considered how God is free to call whoever he wants into his people. We've considered God sovereign in election shows his character and it serves his purpose. And last week, Pastor Beneath helped us to consider that God's glory is displayed both in judgment and mercy as he deals with sinners. So although our primary focus is verse 24 to 20. Nine, we wanted to step back to 22 and see the bigger picture, the context. And Paul says in 22 and 23 the following, What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience? Vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Paul says that God's mercy shines against the backdrop of his judgment, of his right and holy wrath, showing us that salvation to any single person is because of his marvelous grace. Nothing is earned. Nothing is earned. I know we have to repeat that because we live in a world where we earn stuff. We earn our diplomas, our decrees. We earn our paychecks. We earn because we work hard, and we need to, and God has called us to work hard for his glory, though, not for our glory and our fame. So it makes it plain that God owes us nothing. Absolutely nothing. And on our own, we have no claim on anything except what is due to our sin. And yet, in verse 22, he says that God has endured with much patience. Why so much patience from God? 
Again, the wider passage helps us to see that because he wants to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy and grace. We are the objects of his mercy and grace. And God wants to make it known to us. And therefore, he is being patient with us. We're about to learn that the mercy that God is talking about is not just for the people of Israel, but for people all over the world. So that's the main point for us to consider today, being this. God's enduring patience allows for people from all over the world to experience His grace. You know, I stand here and I look at the faces. People from all over the world are here. And it's no coincidence. None of you had to be forced to come here. Maybe our kids a little bit. <laughs> but none of us had to be forced to be here. We're here, we're listening, and we're trusting the Holy Spirit to minister to us. Paul has been saying all along what matters is not our ethnicity, our heritage, or our religious background, such as being a cultural Jew, or in our time, maybe a cultural Christian. Rather, what matters is the calling of God, the grace of God. In verse 24, he says, Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Where does Paul get this news from? That God actually is not just focused on one group of people. In fact, he loves them. They're being rebellious. But that God's door is opening wide to the nations. Where does Paul get this from? Well, I think some of you already know he gets it from the Old Testament. In the last two weeks, we looked at the story of the patriarchs. Of Abraham, of Isaac, and um, in fact, three weeks ago, and Jacob. And then... When Pastor Benita was preaching, we looked at the story of Exodus, Pharaoh, and Egypt. Now Paul moves on to quote the prophets, Hosea and Isaiah. So this movement through the Old Testament reminds us of a key thing, that God's promise has not failed. Genesis, Exodus, the prophets. That represents the Old Testament for us. In doing so, Paul seeks to establish that God has always worked to make and keep his promise. And this often involved surprising reversals in the sovereignty of God. So two key observations for us to look at in today's passage. The first one being this. It has always been God's plan to call those who are far from him. This has always been God's plan. It's been his promise and in his character. That God calls people that are very far from him spiritually. It has been his practice, as Paul once again turns to the Old Testament to illustrate his point. In verse 25 and 26, he gives us two quotes from Hosea. Both of them are meant to magnify the stunning grace of God to an undeserving people. Okay, let's look at verse 25, which is a quote from Hosea 2, verse 23. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. The interesting thing here is that Hosea is talking about Israel becoming God's people. In fact, in chapter 1 of Hosea, God told Hosea to name one of his children, no mercy, another child, not my people. Talk about naming your children. Hosea did not have the luxury to host a gender reveal party or a baby shower. He had to deal with a nation that was bent on rebellion, a people that rejected God and His grace. Now, we should be mindful in this context of Hosea, his heart is wrenching, because why? In the opening chapter, God says, Hosea, I want you to go marry Gomer, and Gomer is going to be unfaithful to you. So he marries her. Second, he says to name your children, no mercy and not my people. You see, uh, Gomer, his wife's unfaithfulness to Hosea and the naming of the children is actually meant to put on display the drama of Israel with God. That God is a faithful husband, a father, and Israel acts as his unfaithful spouse. And the children display that they're not the people and, and, that, and then they forget God's mercy. So Paul is re like reaching all the way back there to prove a point that God 
in despite of that, is being merciful. The name of the children were to remind that God was soon going to reject them because of their unfaithfulness. God would send Assyria and Babylon, the world powers of their day, to come and bring judgment upon them and bring them to exile as punishment. He's also trying to show that God had complete freedom in his sovereign choice to reject Israel in this way, but he also had complete freedom on the other side of the exile to bring a remnant of them back. So in his freedom, in his sovereignty, God will judge our sin, and yet he shows mercy and grace and brings us back. He calls us. And so if God has the sovereign right to call Israel after rejecting them for a time in their captivity, Paul is saying he certainly has the right to call me and you, the Gentiles, people from every other nation and ethnicities, to be his own after letting them go their way for thousands of years. That is God's grace. And then he quotes Hosea again in verse 26. And the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called sons of the living God. Again, Paul applies this verse to all nations that previously were not God's people, but were now becoming the sons of the living God. Okay, so let's think about this for a moment, okay? All over the world, people who were only living in rejection of God and worshiping idols in their hearts were either made by their hands or in their imaginations. But now, there are hundreds of millions of people among the nations across the world through the ages who are God's people. Because of Jesus Christ, they're called the children of God. In fact, the very last book of the Bible, Revelation 5, 9 tells us that there will be Christians in heaven from every single tribe, language, and nation. Paul is saying that God's grace is wide enough to include people from everywhere. He's saying that Jews who are questioning God's promise, he's saying, you know what? God has always been the one who blesses those who do not observe it, deserve it. And we could not have predicted it. If the Gentiles are flocking to become Christ's people, Paul is telling Romans or the Jewish people, should that really surprise you? Uh, this reminded me of when I moved back to Toronto after becoming a Christian. I met a number of people um, of Christian background, but who found out that I was a Hindu formerly, and now that the Lord has saved me and I'm a Christian now. Uh, some of them were in wonder that a Hindu had become Christian. They were born into a Christian family, and that was quite different for them. And they were surprised. In one sense, I agreed with them at the stunning grace of God that would save me, that God would choose to save me. But on the other hand, I was tempted to ask, should you as a Christian be surprised that God saves sinners of all stripes, of all colors, and all ethnicities? Isn't that the gospel? When we come to a growing and a clear understanding of God's sovereignty and His grace, we never stop being amazed at His grace. At the same time, we will grow out of thinking, can God actually do that? We should be amazed, but not surprised. Why? He's the God, the sovereign God of the universe. He spoke creation into being. Nothing is too hard for Him. Paul is saying, can He do that? Yes, he can. He's been saying that in Romans 9. You want to know if God can keep his promise? He says, look at Genesis. Look at Exodus. And now, look at the prophets. God does that very thing. It represents the testimony of God's word. His hand of grace is still at work in the hearts of rebellious sinners. When I was a kid, um, in, living in Germany, I was fascinated with little toy cement trucks. Anyone ever had one of those? Right, I see some head shaking, right? So I used to roll that around. And then later on, I came to learn why that thing had to keep turning, right? And so you'll see a picture of why does that thing have to keep turning? Well, the reality of cement is it kind of keeps stirring so it to be usable. What happens when it stops turning? It hardens. It hardens and the cement is unusable. In fact, recently I was doing that for drywalling. There was a mix you can buy and it's 15 minutes. And I was mixing it and then I was using it and I forgot about it. I looked 
five minutes later, it hardened. It was unusable. And then there's a hand that needs to keep mixing it with water and to keep it usable. And so in one sense, the hand of God is like, the hand of God's grace is like touching us and mixing the cement. Our hearts are hardened cement, like rock on our own. We reject God, but God sovereignly comes in and keeps mixing it. But the moment he removes his hand of grace, it hardens like the heart of Pharaoh. That's how the Pharaoh's heart was hardened. It was already like that. God just removed his hand. And our hearts are like that. That God this morning, if you're not a Christ follower, he wants you to know that it's his hand of grace that takes the heart that's heart and he stirs it and he stirs it and he causes us to look to him. Next time you pass by a cement truck, just think about his hand of grace that has undone our hearts of stone. And Christian, you should praise him when you see a cement truck. <laughs> Nothing matters more than to be joined to Christ by faith. No disaster is worse than to be cut off from Christ. Nothing matters more than to be joined by faith. No disaster is worse than to be cut off from Christ. So if you're not a Christ follower, friend, today's passage tells us that on our own, each of us are far from God, like the people that are being described here, very far from God. It also tells us none of us can make an iota of a difference in our standing before a sovereign God of the universe. On our own, our hearts of sin will forever separate us from God. On our own, we are like Hosea's wife, Gomer, who leaves the one who is constant in his love for her. Friend, God is just to leave us in this way, but here lay the good news to hopeless sinners who are far from God. It has always been God's plan to save those of us who humbly come to him and receive his grace. It has always been his plan to call people from every nation all over the world to come and receive his grace. Friend, that is the gospel. That is the good news of God, that in the person of Jesus Christ, God came down to us because we were too far from him. It was impossible for us to get to him. He, he not only came down to us, but Jesus took our sin upon himself and went to the cross to do what? To pay for our sin penalty that we could never pay. He suffered, he died, and he rose again, defeating sin, death, the curse of sin. And now his hand of grace is being offered to those of us who are far from him. Won't you turn to him? Won't you repent of your sin and trust in him as your only hope in life and death? If you do, Paul says you will be called the children of the living God. For those of us who are Christ followers, who are believers, who are born again, here's an application as a, as a way of reminder. We must rejoice that God would call us my people. We should never take this for granted. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about entitlement. Sometimes we feel entitled. But the sovereignty of God, as has been being reminded, is meant to strike a blow to our pride. Because of the grace of God, we are now His beloved, and we have the blood-bought privilege to call Him Abba, Father. Many of us in this room have immigrated to this country We've become Canadian citizens over the years. And some of you are in the progress of becoming a Canadian citizen. And some of you just recently became a Canadian citizen. And it comes with privileges and responsibilities. How much more the privilege of being called by God, my people. That alone makes him worthy of our praise. Now, as we look to our second observation, Paul moves from God's grace to those who are far from him, to God's mercy, to those who claim to be his people. So here's our second point. It has always been God's plan to save a remnant in Israel. Verse 27 to 29. Again, he goes back to the question, what about ethnic Israel? Is God rejecting them? He made a promise through them so the nations can be blessed. Well, in the sight of hundreds of millions of Gentiles coming to Christ through the ages, and only what seems like a few Jews, it's easy to think this way. 
So in verse 27, 29, Paul looks to another prophet, Isaiah, to show that God has not left Israel without believers. He will always save a remnant a, of, a special, of the special people of God. In 27, 28, he says, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the numbers of the sons of Israel as be the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. The idea here is that God is just and fair judging Israel for their rejection of his kingship and turning to themselves in spiritual idolatry. Yet the same God whose hand is them over to judgment will save what God, Isaiah, calls a remnant. A remnant. In fact, in Isaiah 6, 9, 6, and 7, Paul has already made it clear that not all descendants of Israel belong to Israel. Now he further substantiates this from the Old Testament showing us that God sovereignly saves only some of them as spiritual Israel. So whenever we come across the Old Testament concept of remnant, especially in the prophetic writings, we should bear in mind it contains both the word of judgment and a word of hope. That means uh, the people as a whole have rejected God, and God is saying, hey, listen, you have broken the law. Even you, you understand this idea because we live in a land of laws, right? So if you break a law, you have to suffer the consequence of it, whether it's a ticket or a court. And so a lot of the laws that exist here are driven, are, are taken from the Old Testament. And so same thing with God and his people. They rejected him. They made their own gods and they lived their own way. And God said those have consequences, both spiritually and morally, and eventually how the nation is treated. And so God hands them over to consequences. And then he still draws them back and saves a group of them. both judgment and a word of hope. They were as the sea of the sand, or, or, or sand of the sea, only a remnant will be saved. There were so many, and yet God is still faithful to keep some. Now, some may wonder, what does all have to do with us today? Like, you can say, hey, this is so long ago. Why are we even listening to this? Well, consider the implication. We thought of this a few weeks back, but it's helpful to revisit it. And here's the implication for us in Canada, okay? Despite a Christian heritage and widespread disobedience in our society, God is still saving sinners, okay? So our heritage in Canada is not like the Americans, how, how they moved and they, they, they flew from uh, a religious persecution out of England and other places. Here it's more, we were a British colony for a long time. And so the Church of England had influence, uh, the Orthodox Church, uh, the Catholic Church. So there's some influence. So we, in some sense, have a heritage. We have a heritage. And in the last few decades, a lot has changed. A lot has changed. Broadly speaking, Canada has only driven further and further away from whatever was a good heritage, whatever was a good influence from a biblical perspective. We see this in governance. We see this in popular culture. We see this in the cultural elites, in academia, in what can only be described as, uh, even in business world, woke capitalism. That's always trying to identify with the ever-changing morality because they're worried about the bottom line. Yet here we are this morning, worshiping, the God who saves and tells of his saving grace, even though Christ's followers in Canada are a small minority. And the culture looks hostile to it, saying, who do you think you are? Paul says in verse 29, another quotation from Isaiah. He says this, And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Paul wants to make it clear that despite their rebellion, God will not reject the entire nation like Sodom and Gomorrah. Because he's the God who makes promise and keeps a promise. Earlier, Paul used Hosea to show us God's grace is wide enough to include people from all over the world. Now he uses Isaiah to show us that God's mercy is deep enough to save the people who have personally rejected him. It is both wide and deep. We see here that even in God's judgment, His mercy is found. 
though they be few, his offspring will come in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. So let me close with one final thought and application, how God's enduring patience holds up the grace and the mercy of God to a rebellious people. Today's passage holds grace and mercy in front of us against the coming judgment of God. In one sense, Jesus is offering his hand of grace to you and I. In the other sense, he's holding off mercy, the judgment that we deserve. But one day, Jesus has promised that he'll come back. And when he comes back, the grace that's being offered and extended, the mercy that's holding back God's judgment will be removed. And at that point, all who continue to live in rejection, harden their heart against God, will face one thing, a holy God who demands justice from a sinful people. None of us will have an iota of an excuse to make before God, especially if you're here this morning hearing and considering the gospel. But here is the word of hope in the meantime. The enduring patience of God is allowing for you and for me, the people from all over the world, to experience His grace. And a closing application for us in light of that. We must seek humility in light of God's sovereignty. We, this chapter is one that is really meant to blow the hardest punch to our pride. There is no biblical, so deeply humbling reality to human pride than the doctrine of God's sovereign election, where His grace and mercy freely flows to us. Our inclusion into God's family is purely of His doing. We did everything possible to run the other direction. I know I did. But God in His grace did the impossible. He saves us and He restores us. This humbling reality must shape the way we view and treat um, one another in private and in public. Okay, here's my, just I think of this very, this is a key thing for us. I've been, especially in the last few years, the pandemic brought to the surface relational stuff in people's lives that were just, we were too busy hiding because of work and travel and entertainment and every other thing. And it made us live in our homes and realize how ugly our relationships were sometimes. But if we say that we're a people who have received grace and mercy, then our relationships should feel it. Why? Because my relationship with me and with you and my family is an index to my relationship with God. It reveals the reality of who is in me and living through me. Each of us are debtors of God's grace and mercy. So those who seem to be doing better than us, they owe all it to God's compassion. And when you are tempted to look down on those who may be struggling, know this, they are receiving the same grace and they're on the same level as you and I. This is one way God works humility in us so that we can live together in harmony as a people who are gathered here from all over the world. This way, when we are faced with seemingly a hard and a hostile pushback to the gospel by the people we're trying to witness to, we won't be quick to dismiss them and move on with our lives. Why? Because the free grace of God is able to bring the most unlikely people, like Paul, like me, and like you, to him. So we mustn't give up on them. God's enduring patience allows for people from all over the world to experience his grace. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. We thank you, God, that your patience is enduring, long-suffering, and that your grace and your mercy makes it possible, that this is your very character, that you reveal yourself this way. And we thank you this morning that we look in this room of how you brought people from so many nations, from all over the world, to receive your grace, to experience it, and that that might be a reality in our relationships. That people would know, indeed, this is the God who saves and changes us and one day receives us to glory. So please help us, Holy Spirit, to draw near to you as you draw near to us.